I think most people are back after lunch. Hopefully you enjoyed your lunch and also <laughs> were aware of the purpose of eating. So the main purpose is so that we can practice. The Buddha says, you know, to maintain the body but without vanity, without wishing for a beautiful or attractive body, just so that we can continue to practice the meditation. So I think for a lot of people after lunch it can... Uh, we can get quite sleepy, especially if we've eaten a little bit too much. And um, I turned a couple of these heaters off because it felt to me quite warm in here. But um, if anybody needs more blankets, <laughs> let us know. So this afternoon I'm going to start again with a bit of a Dhamma reflection. I promise it will be shorter this time. <laughs> um, I gave you quite a long Dhamma talk, first thing. <laughs> So if you feel sleepy at any time, you're welcome to stand up and stretch, but it will just be half an hour or so. And then we'll have a guided meditation on one aspect of the Satipatthana Sutta. And again, these guided meditations are offerings. It's not an instruction that you must follow. It's just an offering. And if you feel like picking that up, you're most welcome. Otherwise, you can continue to practice the way you would normally do. And then we'll have a bit of walking meditation and then a session for question and answers. So... We've had this system, we decided to have a system where the questions were written down, and this is so that we can record the uh, session. A lot of people are really interested in question and answer sessions because they tend to be quite relevant to people's own you know, interests or struggles. Um, but if anybody wants to ask from the floor, that's also fine. Um, and please just speak to Louise if uh, you have any objection to that being... Um, on your London Insight website. So, you know, it is confidential and you don't have to agree to that. So, just so you know. And then we'll end at about five. We'll have another meditation before we end. Okay? So, this morning we were talking a lot about the context of mindfulness and how we can build the mindfulness up through the gradual training. And now I wanted to go into the Satipatthana Sutta and the specific teachings on, on that that the Buddha gave. So it's quite interesting that this picks up precisely where we left off just before the hindrances in the gradual training, where we said that the person is now ready to go into seclusion. And at that point, they already had a certain amount of well-being and happiness in the mind. Can everybody hear me, just to check? Mm -hmm. So they already had a certain amount of wellness, happiness, ease in the body and the mind before going into seclusion. And so the Satipatthana picks up at that point. So we can infer from this that it's basically used to overcome the last traces of the hindrances. And this is directly sort of leading us into deeper stillness. So the purpose of Satipatthana is often discussed as being insight. And this is definitely one of the purposes, but also that insight, as we get insight into the nature of reality, we can learn to let it go. And as we gradually abandon that clinging, we can enter deeper and deeper states of samadhi. And so essentially in the teachings, you'll find that the Satipatthana Sutta and the teachings in there come either just before the jhanas or after. So it's almost like there's a pre and a post jhana Satipatthana. And again, this points to the different levels of mindfulness. So if you're practicing before jhana meditation, where there's still some hindrances left, <coughs> you use the Satipatthana practices to overcome those and the mindfulness will still be developing. But if we then pick it up after deep states of stillness, the power of the mind is so much stronger, and I think this is where the liberating insight can arise. You know, but it's all a gradual thing, and so we can pick it up wherever uh, we need to, but it's good to know why we're practicing, for what purpose, and what outcome. <coughs> so that's the basic context of the Satipatthana. And... Yeah, some people translate Satipatthana as um, the establishments of mindfulness. And this isn't exactly incorrect, but I like to think of it more as like the place we direct our mindfulness. I spoke before about how mindfulness always has to be directed to something. And with the Satipatthana Sutta, we already have a certain amount of mindfulness established before practicing this. So it's like awareness that we have already is like the beam of the torch, or the flashlight in American. And the Satipatthana is where we direct that beam of light. So we already have some awareness, and now we're directing it on specific areas of phenomena, which is basically the body and the mind. But it's interesting, because I asked my father last week what he thought mindfulness was, and he said, um, oh, I think it's being aware of body, mind, and surroundings. 
which I thought was quite interesting because a lot of people forget the context and that we're relational beings. And actually in the Satipatthana Sutta also, it does talk after each practice. It says we need to understand that internally and externally. So in a sense, the same theme is there in the Satipatthana Sutta. We're aware of body and mind, but we're also aware of other people's body and mind to a lesser or greater degree, sometimes just through influence. But this, again, helps break down those barriers that we erect between self and other, you know, and that help to establish this very strong ego identity by seeing that, you know, just as I have changing emotions, changing sensations, changing bodily postures, you know, my body is subject to birth, age, decay and death, so are all other beings, so is the body of all other beings. So it's constantly kind of looking outside and using that as a mirror for our own human condition and using what we see inside as a kind of window into how other people experience life. So I think this again points to the idea of compassion. You know, that's the natural response really when you realize that we're suffering and you know other people suffer in exactly the same ways with their mental patterning, you know, and it's not we're not alone with that. So that it's interesting this comes through as a theme again and again in the teachings. So, yeah, the Satipatthanas are actually known as pastures in the suttas, which again suggests that these are areas in which we direct our attention. It's almost like we're grazing our mind in those places because those places are the places where we assume some kind of permanent identity or some kind of lasting happiness, something that's not going to change, and yet those areas are precisely the places that do change most obviously, you know. <coughs> So, yeah, the other thing about this that's quite interesting is that in the beginning it says that anyone who should practice this way will become enlightened in seven years. And then the Buddha said, what to say of seven years? If they practice this way, will be enlightened in six years. And then in five years and four years, and you're thinking, ooh, <laughs> there's a bit of pressure now because I've been sitting 20 years. <laughs> and eventually the Buddha comes back down to seven days. And he said, for anyone who follows these instructions, you know, he guarantees, I think, um, once returning, which is the stage where you've overcome all lust and ill will, so all wanting and aversion, or full enlightenment, which is the end of all suffering. So we're thinking, hmm, what am I doing wrong here? <laughs> and it's really important to notice that there's this passage in this text which comes again and again as a kind of preliminary. And it's actually teaching us what we need to have in place first. Okay, so right in the beginning it says atapi uh, sampajana satima, right? Some of you have recognised some of those words. Satima means basically one who has mindfulness. Okay, so again we already should have some amount of mindfulness established <coughs> through the training that we've been doing with the virtue, through the right effort, and through this kind of ever-increasing sense of happiness and joy and energy in the mind. So we already have this satima, this sati. Atapi sampajano satima means, atapi means like energized mindfulness. So it's not just that you can be mindful of something, but you can sustain your awareness energetically in that area or on that phenomena. Yeah? Atapi sampajana, again, we were talking about sati sampajana, which means sati along with wisdom. And in this case, knowing the purpose would mean knowing the purpose of the satipatthana practice. Yeah? So we know why we're practicing Satipatthana, which is to uncover, again, the three characteristics. The places where we assume a sense of self or we assume something permanent, something you know, of lasting happiness. We need to uncover this, these areas. So atapi sampajano satima. And then the next sentence, which really struck me after years of practicing in Burma, was vinaya loke abhijja domanasam, which I don't know if anybody speaks Pali, but vinaya is similar to Vinaya, which are the rules of monastic discipline. And it actually means restraint. It doesn't mean like a rule or many times we, you know, people think that the code of conduct are like rules that are laid down, but it's actually restraint. And as we were saying before, restraint isn't about avoidance. It's about learning how to attend in a skillful way that gives rise to wholesome qualities increasing and undermines the unwholesome qualities. So Vinaya means we're restraining Abhijja Domanasa. And these two words have been translated uh, in most of the texts as covetousness and grief for the world. Does that make any sense to anyone? Because I think that's quite obscure. 
And um, a lot of our teachers in Perth who are quite good Pali scholars, like Ajahn Brahmali and I think Bhante Analio as well, who's based in America now, they've been looking into these words and they find that actually they're being used as synonyms for the first two of the five hindrances. So it actually means having restrained the first two hindrances. And whenever two hindrances are singled out, it usually means that the rest are included in that group. It's like the first two of a group. Mm. So it means having restrained the five hindrances. And then we practice the Satipatthana Sutta. So this is something I think that's often missing. And I know for myself, I was wondering, because I went quite deep with sensations and you know, really observing the change in characteristic and noticing that you know, everything was surely arising and passing and subject to cessation, and yet somehow it was arising and passing incessantly with no end. <laughs> and I was thinking, hmm, what's going on here? You know, I think everything's impermanent, but it seems that this experience of impermanence is very permanent. <laughs> it didn't seem to come to an end. There was also a sense that there's somebody observing that's permanent, you know, that's not quite touched by this. There's some observer there that's constant. So I knew that something was missing, you know, I knew this. And then I was thinking, hmm, the hindrances? I didn't really see the hindrances very much, not in the form of strong craving or ill will at all. I was really very happy and contented in the <coughs> monastery in Burma and could sit for hours, you know, I would love to sit for hours each day, each month, and that turned into years. And yet I realized after a while there was a subtle hindrance of restlessness because the very practice I was doing was about scanning the body. And I didn't scan all the time, but there was a certain amount of movement in the mind. And even this is a hindrance to jhana, because this is a state of very, very deep stillness. So there was still a sense of me being in control somehow. And that's kind of sometimes scary for people to hear that we're not in control. But I think when you practice, you start to realize that the more you do interfere and control what's happening, the more you sort of get in the way of the process. And it's a very natural process that, if the foundations are established well, builds gradually and it builds on this very ethical basis, you know, and we can refine that by allowing the wholesome qualities to increase. But the more we kind of fiddle, (laughs) the more we kind of mess things up again and again. (laughs) And this is really obvious kind of when you go into deeper states of... uh, of stillness, you know, there's this kind of tendency to want to oversee what's happening. Am I still okay? Am I still there? You know, am I still involved somehow? And every time that happens, the stillness kind of lifts. And every time you can let go, it increases again. So it's like a natural process that starts happening. Sounds a bit scary, perhaps. (laughs) (laughs) So I wanted to talk about each one of these in brief. And just tell me to stop if it goes more than brief. (laughs) But, um, yeah, I think we've talked about the context and the preparation. So, yeah, there's a sequence to these Satipatthanas. So we start with the body, okay? And in the text, the body starts off with the breath, which is quite interesting because there's this phrase, kaye kayanupasi viharati. It means one who dwells, observing body in the body. That's how it's usually translated. But it can also mean a body among the bodies. And so the Buddha does talk about breath as one of the bodies. Mm. And it's very interesting because in another sutta it says that the four, or even in this one, that if you practice anapana, you complete the four satipatthanas. So if you practice anapana from beginning to end, right through to the jhanas and then post jhana, seeing the impermanence, seeing the characteristic of non-self, seeing cessation, you practice the four satipatthanas. So the body, the breath is a kind of body in the bodies. And it's the first method mentioned in the body meditation. Only the first four parts of the breath meditation are there, but they're the ones that are connected more to the physical body. So it's like observing whether the breath is long or short, observing the breath calming down, and observing the whole body of the breath, which means the whole breath. That's actually the third one. And the fourth one is to just calm it all down. So it means calming down the breath, calming down the body, and all the mental formations around that. So this is when we go into kind of more of a tranquility kind of experience. So breath is the first one, and that's actually the practice the Buddha used himself when he became enlightened. And there's a nice little quote somewhere which talks about the breath. Yeah, and it talks about it in relationship to unwholesome thoughts, So it says, peaceful and sublime, an unadulterated, blissful abiding, 
which banishes at once and stills bad, unwholesome thoughts as soon as they arise. Yeah? So breath meditation is supposed to be blissful. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this can actually start to happen if the preparation's done and if we're not sort of pulling it in or trying to go onto it too quickly. So, you know, in this case, we've already undermined the hindrances and so the breath meditation has a chance to take hold. But you don't need to worry because there are many other contemplations in this body section. And um, just so I get it in the right order, the next one is actually postures. So it's similar to what we were doing with the walking meditation. We're aware when we're walking forward or going back. We're aware when we're eating. We're aware when we're in the toilet. You know, everything we're doing, we're aware. But at the level of Satipatthana, it's more than just aware. It's also aware of the purpose, about how suitable what we're doing is to our goal. And also to be aware that these are not coming from a self. The movements are not coming from a self. They're coming through volition. They're coming through will. It's an impersonal process again. Yeah? So that's the uh, postures. And then also sati sampajanya. So I think it's, it's very similar. Probably I'm mixing them up. But it's kind of the same thing. It's the movement in various ways. And you know what we're doing and why. And then the next one is, uh, the next two actually, is it? Oh yeah, the next two are the ones that are found, because some of our teachers are doing kind of parallel um, studies with the Chinese um, version of the texts, and they're looking at all the different Satipatthana suttas across all the Pali canon and also the Chinese canon, <coughs> and they're finding that some things are similar and some things are quite different in these different uh, translations or these different languages. And often when you find that they're quite different, it's a sign that perhaps something's been added or, you know, or extracted. But when you have the same thing going across all the texts and it's been preserved for you know, 2,000, maybe 400 years, you can pretty much rely on the fact that it's authentic. And so the next one, which is the body parts, is one of the things that's found throughout all the different versions of the Satipatthana Sutta and the one after that, which is the elements. So I think these two are really key, as well as the breath meditation, yeah? So the body parts is a kind of way to look at the body in terms of its functional aspect rather than you know, its appearance or whether we think we conform to the right body image or whatever it is, whether we wish we were still younger or we think getting old is rather cool. It's not about that. It's about the functional aspect. And looking at it in terms of parts such as skin, blood, bones tends to undermine this inf infatuation that we can have with the body. So it just brings us to a more balanced perspective. But um, it's, it's sometimes a little bit dangerous to teach this. <laughs> One example in the uh, text is that um, the Buddha taught this to a group of monks, probably about 500 monks, I think. They never talk about nuns, but they were there. <laughs> um, and basically, they practice this, but they practice looking at these body parts as though they are unattractive. So focusing on the unattractive aspect of the body, you know, it's the way you incline the mind. You can also focus in it just as function, but they were focusing on the unattractive aspect. And they all ended up committing suicide. So the Buddha thought, uh oh, what happened there? And I don't know if he continued to teach that to many monks and nuns, but um, I think it just shows that this is something that's for a very specific purpose. Maybe if you're the kind of person who really has an issue with kind of craving, wanting, attraction, lust, you know, and this is really a, an issue for you. But I think it's important not to see the body as something disgusting. We have a body, it has a certain purpose. You know, it's our vehicle, actually, for the practice. So, you know, we have to be careful how we attend. Yeah? And yet, at the same time, it can be quite helpful. I did a retreat with Bhante Analia, and he was actually going through the parts. He was kind of doing body scans, and we'd look, for the, look at the skin in one scan. Mm. Then we'd look at the... I think he just did skin, flesh, and bones, yeah? Rather than going part by part like with the organs and this kind of thing. And that was quite interesting, just to get a sense that I can experience myself just as skin or just as bone. You know? And again, internal, external, everybody has the same. So if I just look out and see all this skin now, it's like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then the next one is the elements. And the elements are really interesting because they 
counter the tendency to over-identify with our feelings and our kind of physical makeup again, you know, because we can see that it's just derived of these four key elements, earth, water, fire, and air. But in practice, it's more helpful to see the elements in terms of their actual qualities. So you could see, say, earth element as the aspect of solidity. It also has the aspect of texture and um, weight, yeah? so anything that's heavy. The whole field, from the heaviest to the lightest, is the field of earth because it's weight. And then texture, like rough, smooth, slippery, soft or hard, this is all the earth element. And it's possible to experience these kind of sensations in the body. Yeah, that's just one example. And then, so fire would be the field of temperature, yeah? Fire element, so we can always experience, even now, you know, sort of roughly a te- some kind of temperature in the body, whether it's more towards the hot or the cold, but there's a field of temperature. You know, and if it goes sort of too far beyond, too hot or too cold, then it, it risks our life, it risks our health. I think that happened to me in Burma. I felt I was overheating for many years, and I still have chronic gastritis and acid because of that. It's as though my body... I mean, that's probably not medically correct, but according to Indian medicine, it makes sense. You know, it's as though the body got overheated. So that's an excess of fire element, yeah? And then the, the air element you can understand by movement and oscillation, so it's the field of movement, you know, it, any time my hands move, that's air element. Or you can feel it, especially when you're frightened. You know, you can sometimes feel a trembling, maybe in the abdomen or the heart area, and that's all the field of air. It's that movement. And then the last one would be what have I missed out? Water. So water is the element which is coherent. It, it brings things together. It holds things together. So coherence and fluidity. So that whole field. And even as I talk about it, I can feel my saliva. It's quite interesting. So we can contemplate the body in these ways, and there are lots of practices. We can't really do everything today, but I'm going to choose a practice from all of this. Um, But it's interesting to know this, because it's another way of practicing, especially if you're getting kind of tired of just feeling the body and the sensations and the emotions. You say, okay, let me have a look now for earth element. and just It's an interesting way to observe, and you'll find it actually affects the mental state too. I noticed when I was practicing in one retreat and focusing on softness that my mind became very soft too. It was almost like the practice of metta. It was really nice. And the hardness gave me a sense of being quite solid and grounded. So this is quite a nice way to practice. So that's the elements. And uh, yeah, known by their qualities. And then the next one is the cemetery contemplations. But again, it's not found in all the suttas and it may not be that original. But I think the whole purpose of it, I mean, the Buddha talks about going to see a corpse and noticing the corpse decaying over a period of time. And you can do it that way, but I think it's more helpful to reflect on the fact that my own body is subject to death and decay. So just as that body is now lifeless, stiff, you know, decaying, talks about the bones left just with a smear of blood and then no smear of blood and then powder, (laughs) you know, the whole kind of process. But the idea is that we reflect that we also will become that way. And not to kind of freak us out, but in a way just to bring us more fully into the present and to realize now I've got the time, now I've got the chance to practice. You know? How amazing is that? I was in Hamburg a couple of years ago and there was this fantastic cemetery. I think it's the biggest in Europe. It has around a million um, gravestones all different kinds of parts to the cemetery. There's a Jewish part, there's a Chinese part, there's just so much to it. And apparently there were about a million people in Hamburg. (laughs) And uh, so every time I saw somebody, I thought, gosh, for every one of these people I'm seeing, like walking in the street, there's, there's one in the graveyard, you know? And it's a lot more than that. So here we are now alive, but we don't know how long we've got. So this also can tie into the contemplation on death which is another reflection and recollection that the Buddha prays. Yeah? So this is the field of body. And I've almost run over my time. <laughs> <coughs> so the next one, which is really important to bring up, is uh, feeling. Okay? Because uh, feeling is our direct experience. It's what we, how we know we're here, how we know we're alive. And as I said earlier, feeling is a sort of quite a loose translation because it can mean either physical or mental. It could mean emotion. 
But what the Buddha's really pointing to are the effective tone of experience, so whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Neutral means somewhere in between, not particularly you know, pleasant or unpleasant. And this is really important because feeling is caused by contact, and we have to be in contact all the time with objects outside, so contact whether at the eye sense door or the nose sense door, the ear, the tongue sense door, body or mind. So there's these six kind of ways of contact that produce their own feelings. And then from feeling, the next link in the whole cycle of dependent origination is craving. So it has this direct link because when we feel pleasant sensations, it tends to give rise to craving. When we feel unpleasant sensations, it tends to give rise to aversion or ill will or negativity of some kind. Yeah? Sometimes you wake up just not feeling quite right and everything just looks miserable. <laughs> the food doesn't taste right, you're not really happy with the people in the house, you know, little things that don't affect you normally affect you in a major way. So, you know, often it's because there's a feeling in the body that's unpleasant and we're not aware of that, we're just reacting without understanding why. So this feeling is a really important link and we can work at this particular point in, and have a look at how these emotions, these reactions arise and realize that, yeah, it's just pleasant feeling. It's just painful feeling. It's just neutral feeling. Neutral feeling is normally when you get bored. <laughs> you, know, you try to get some more stimulation because neutral is quite hard to, to uh, notice. Yeah? It's kind of that... It actually shouldn't be a foggy feeling because it's quite hard to notice. The mind needs to be stronger and more aware. But sometimes we're, we kind of just drift off because there's not enough to catch us. Sometimes we'd even rather have an unpleasant feeling because it makes us feel like present mm. and alive and I exist. <laughs> neutral can be quite tricky and yet over some time you start to realise neutral is actually much more pleasant in many ways because there's less to it. <laughs> it's just that little bit less loaded. Yeah. And the other important thing about feeling is that there are three types but that can be, <laughs> that can be extended to six because each type of feeling has a worldly aspect and a, a kind of more spiritual aspect. So we can have a feeling which is pleasant that is very much related to the senses, yeah, towards getting pleasure in any one of the senses. But then there's also a feeling that is pleasant, which is a spiritual pleasure, and that's the pleasure of meditation or the pleasure of sila, the se pleasure of restraint yeah, that we talked about earlier. And when you start to be able to discern between the skillful and unskillful types of happiness you know which one to pursue, then this helps to overcome doubt about what we should be doing. Yeah? So when the happiness comes in meditation and we're sure that this isn't essential happiness, it's safe to go there. And the Buddha actually said, you know, why should I be afraid of that pleasure that has nothing to do with sensual desire, nothing to do with attachment? <coughs> yeah? Sometimes people think we're going to get attached to these states, but actually mm -hmm. it's when we let go of a lesser pleasure that we're able to access these kind of much more refined pleasures. And we might not notice them at first, they can be very subtle. But even just the idea of being content where I am right now, there's a happiness to that, yeah, that we so often tend to overlook. So that's about feeling. And I wanted to go into the mind a little bit because the mind, Satipatthana, is, is a little bit more uh, like turning our attention way, away from the body although feeling is also an aspect of the mind, but it's turning from a specific feeling to a more general state of mind. So we're looking at whether the mind is distracted, contracted, um, what are the other words he is? Contracted, distracted, um, basically a mind with the hindrances and knowing it, just knowing it. Yeah? Not, it's contracted, that's no good, I need to expand it, nothing like that, just knowing a contracted mind as a contracted mind. One example of a contracted mind is a tired mind. You kind of, your world's kind of shrinking. You know, you're trying to kind of wake up and be aware of what's happening, but you're just kind of shrinking down. The distracted mind is a kind of aspect of restlessness. You just can't stay in one place. It's boop, 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 following whatever comes, yeah, or just going off on a spin. And then the other four are kind of more looking toward the states of jhana, so the exalted mind, the uh, mind made great, I think, is the literal translation, and the stilled mind, which is the mind of samadhi, yeah? And these different mind states. 
so we're just trying to understand this and one of the best ways to understand it is actually to practice to the point of deep absorption when the senses, the actual bodily senses start to fade into the background a bit you know sometimes you don't even feel the body as a very solid entity anymore it starts to become, recede into the background even the breath can start to disappear yeah and the mind becomes much more predominant sometimes like lights arise in the mind this is you know what's known as nimitta and this is a sign that you know the senses are kind of dropping away and the mind is becoming illuminated yeah it's just a stage on the path it's like the buddha says it's like extracting gold extracting the impurities out of the gold so that you can see the gold you know on its own and this helps us to see the difference between the mind and the other senses sometimes we think the mind's always there but it's not actually always there and sometimes it's eye consciousness sometimes it's nose consciousness sometimes it's ear consciousness other times it's mind consciousness they're actually separate yeah and then the last one is dhamma and this is interesting because it l- loosely means phenomena and it's been difficult for, i think even for translators to really pin down what what it's getting at but from looking at the different um, versions of this sutta the common um, elements of dhamma nupassana are the five hindrances again <laughs> and the seven enlightenment factors and that's because these two things are the chief kind of impediments and aids to awakening so the hindrances are those that obstruct awakening the enlightenment factors are those which develop as the hindrances are undermined so the more the hindrances are undermined the more these enlightenment factors get a chance to be developed and to mature yeah and the buddha went one step further to notice not only the absence or presence of these things in the mind but to notice how they're arising why they're arising yeah what leads to the hindrances arising what leads to the enlightenment factors arising and how can we abandon the hindrances <coughs> how can we develop the enlightenment factors yeah so we start to notice causality and i think that's one of the reasons i like to um really emphasize kindness in the practice because this is one way to do both at once <laughs> to undermine the hindrances you know it undermines every hindrance even um restlessness <coughs> you know restlessness is not being content where you are it's not being happy where you are but if you add kindness to that experience you know it makes that it, it makes it easier to stay with the object like ajahn brown says you know when when you have a lot of loving kindness you don't need much effort to hold the mind to the object you just don't need effort anymore so then you know it it counters this tendency to use too much force in meditation or to think i'm doing something wrong i can't grab it you know you're not meant to grab it <laughs> you're meant to attract it through kindness yeah so this is the kind of causality aspect looking at how these hindrances arise what leads to their arising you know with restlessness and tiredness sometimes we've just been pushing ourselves too hard just been trying too hard <laughs> it's so common isn't it i mean i'm doing this myself so you know i said to one of my friends if i come and talk about that it sounds a bit hypocritical because i know that i'm doing too much at the moment <laughs> and yet also on the other hand what sustains me i think is that i have this sense of purpose so in this sense you know the sati sampajanya there's a sense of knowing why i'm doing it and what the purpose is you know it's to give opportunities for people to practice it's to give opportunities for women to actually come and be ordained but not be in a system which is basically not giving them the opportunity to develop as far as they can you know they're not getting the full training they're not getting to make decisions in their own community the way they should be so although it seems sometimes to me like a little bit kind of going into the world and looking at kind of physical practicalities <laughs> i think you do need a healthy foundation in order to really develop deep spiritual practice and the buddha talked about conducive conditions you know so wise friendship spiritual support all of this is part of it and i think it's also why we come here you know just to practice with others so yeah there were some studies done recently about depression and they said uh, in the past we believed you know the doctors believed that it's due to a lack of serotonin sometimes um genetic or you know something with your own biological makeup you just don't produce enough but apparently there are these drug companies which really distort the studies and i think one case in america some time back had about 270 studies but they only published the 27 that actually showed that antidepressants worked they didn't publish the rest 
And there are all these statistics that say um, people on antidepressants usually feel better, but within a year they're depressed again, you know. And in this article they were saying that they've started to do research now into social um, reasons for depression. And they found that we all have a psychological need to feel valued and to feel that we belong and to feel that there's a sense of purpose in our life. You know, we're able to help ourselves and help others. And it's when this is missing that people get depressed. So I think, you know, understanding why we're here, what we're doing, the purpose of what we're doing can add a lot of joy to life. And it's also part of the Satipatthana practice. Yeah? So I'll try to wind up now. Mm-hmm. And um, we can have questions later if there's anything that you want to go into more depth with. But I thought we'd... Um, I'm not going to let you out. Because <laughs> you've only been here half an hour, unless you're dying for the toilet. <laughs> but uh, I thought we could maybe just stand up and stretch and then have about 40 minutes meditation. Okay?